it's uh, uh, again another opportunity for us to learn, grow, discuss, talk. <laughs> uh, it's uh, such a pleasure that we can have this medium to be able to do this. Uh, well, today, uh, uh, as you probably noticed in your post, that uh, Sachin is going to lead us in the study. And uh, we are actually doing uh, the concluding part in the section uh, where we, we, I mean, it was a section titled The Study of Last Things or Eschatology. And uh, the specific subject that Sachin will touch upon is the resurrection. Uh, in our fellowship, we have always, uh, you know, uh, studied about and talked about the resurrection. And uh, of course, uh, with the Reformation, we have come to understand it perhaps in a, a little bit more uh, closer to the biblical perspective rather than speculating too much. So let me, uh, if that's okay with Praveen, let me just uh, go ahead and uh, pray, give Praveen a break today, <laughs> and we'll get into the subject. Join me as I ask for God's blessing on our session today. Gracious, loving Father, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, what a pleasure it is, Lord, to join with our brothers and sisters uh, in this study. And I know that as we do this, your presence is with us, guiding us, leading us. Certainly, Father, we want you to open our minds to understand and also to receive uh, what you have uh, purposed for us to know, especially with the with the specific uh, subject of resurrection. That is a wonderful hope that we have. Uh, we know that uh, we will look forward to that when the second coming. And as we do this, open our minds and Father hearts to understand and learn. We do want to commit the session into your hands. We thank you for this opportunity in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and then uh, uh, Request Sachin to take it away from here. Thank you, Pastor Dan. And a very good evening to everyone. Uh, today, as uh, Pastor Dan has said, we'll be continuing with our Bible study on the subject of eschatology. I was supposed to lead my session after Praveen, uh, but I had to travel to Yavatmal to be with my parents. And thank you for your prayers uh, that my dad is doing well. He's recovering and as I was just saying that uh, his recovery has uh, even surprised the doctors and us and he in fact uh, talked with me and Anna on Sunday uh, that was a pleasant surprise and we thank God that he is recovering well and you would have noticed uh, that uh, this year uh, Pastor Dan's speaking team which is myself, Praveen, uh, Anand, Joshila, you will see them as well, uh, leading the Bible study session because he wanted us to lead this year. Uh, although I didn't anticipate it that this would be a subject, but here we are. Yeah. And so before we start, uh, let me share a few things that we will do in today's Bible study. Uh, now, when I was a kid, I used to love flying kites. And one of the uh, tricky thing for while fl flying the kites is that the thread will get tangled all around and then I would need my dad's help to sort it out and while sort it out he had one practice he would always hand over me one end then he will give me one something to hold on and he'll say hold it on while I am I am sorting it out and then as he would ask me I'll give him that particular part and sooner or later we find the thing sorted out quite well and we'll use similar uh, things today We'll hold on to few things as we go through this session. Probably we hold hold on to verses, uh, stories uh, as we go along. Uh, and then we'll try and connect uh, as it comes. Now, let me summarize all the three sessions because they are interconnected to each other. Uh, Praveen led us in part one. That was the second coming of the Christ. Uh, Christ is coming back to earth so that he can dwell with humanity forever. That was the core, dwelling with humanity. Then Pastor Dan led us into judgment. We saw it's about restoration. 
and then in the second session of pastor dan uh, we talked about universalism and when i was um, of course i had to go through the youtube session i couldn't be part of it but there were many part where i felt of unmuting myself and say and then i realized it's a youtube one so so it was that engaging so well in the universalism we saw that uh, we saw what is gci stand and we saw what is the right thing and we also saw that in universalism people think everybody will be saved everybody will get a second chance and pastor dan was able to clarify that now moving ahead today the topic of my session is resurrection a hope for the future now we'll have a following approach in our study today we'll refer some bible verses about the resurrection and we try to understand more about it then we'll see how other people have interpreted these bible references we'll also see what is gci stand and on certain section i'll share my personal conviction or interpretation yeah so let's then unpack before we jump right into resurrection i think it's more important to see what leads to resurrection and for that allow me to share my screen because i have so many verses to share and then it would be better if i can use ppts then i don't have to read all of them okay one second okay Okay. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Now I want to start off my study from here. Genesis chapter one verse twenty six, and then God said, "Let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness." that means we have made in god's image and we have his character in us and by that definition we are relatable to him but have you noticed uh, why did he said let us make mankind in his own image why didn't he said let us make two humans one my own second which i whom i will not love second whom i will kill second whom my people would kill one i will predestine other i will let him face the face the heat also notice god didn't clone us neither he made us a robots okay but he made us in his image and in his likeness with an expectation so that we could be relatable with him have you ever wonder why did he created us in his own image and what was his intention now here is my personal conviction now god the father god the son and the holy spirit existed even before the start of the time and they had this perfect relationship with each other and in that relationship they had complete freedom yet they had each of them had distinct character they were one in thought they were one in action they were one in work yet different responsibilities and their living was in perfect harmony and now god wanted to extend that relationship with humanity and he wanted to dwell with us forever and at that one they cre- he created us like him and in his character and now this plan and promise of god of dwelling with us is so evident and is clearly mentioned throughout the bible we see in uh, ezekiel my dwelling place shall be with them and i will be their god and they shall be my people continues with jeremiah also same when in fact if you read chapter uh, verse 40 it says i will put a desire in their hearts to worship me and they will never leave me what a love and what a what a expectation out of this relationship now this is not just re- this thought of of god's expectation didn't remain in the old testament with his so called people israelite it has extended to us through christ and we see that happening in the uh, new testament as well and we see in corinthians chapter 6 verse 16 and the second part of it this is, i will live with them and i will walk with them and i will be their god and they will be be my people you see that 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 
that a very close relationship is is expecting and the core of pravin message on revelation in revelation chapter 21 verse 3 behold the dwelling place of god is with man and he will uh, okay and his will be his people and he will be god himself and they will be his people now this throughout the bible we come across many places where god is reaffirming his love and his plan for us over and over again in fact this has been always god's plan for the entire humanity it covered his people israel and then later it extended to entire humanity through christ now we cannot choose god and choose to partake in his rela- relationship by ourselves because of our inherent sinful nature it creates a barrier and that we clearly see as it is in john chapter 3 verse 19 and they said this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil and we read again in corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 but a natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of god for they are foolishness to him that he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised now this means we need god's grace to be able to respond to his call and to partake in a in this relationship and god has made that possible through his son jesus christ as we read it in john chapter 3 verse 16 for this is how the god loved the world he gave his only and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life and the same we read it in ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 that means now if we want to spend an eternity with god then we need to ensure that we need to live with him forever and for that to happen we need to know and to believe about resurrection right now let's go into resurrection now we know and read about resurrection in the bible and believe it through the resurrection of jesus christ right we read about resurrection in the bible and the the proof and the most evidence is the resurrection of jesus christ as we see it in first corinthians chapter 15 verse 3 and 8 here it says about when christ was resurrected his disciples saw him people saw him so that's the biggest evidence that christ was resurrected christ died for our sin just as scripture said he was resurrected and everybody saw him now in fact apostle paul goes to affirm the resurrection to this level that he says if there is no resurrection of the dead then not even christ has been raised and if christ has not been raised our preaching is useless and so is your faith it goes on in saying first corinthians chapter 15 verse 13 and 14 to that level apostle paul goes now in 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 other words if there isn't any resurrection a faith is pointless if christianity is simply about this physical life then we die to never exist again and then it really doesn't matter what we do or how we live or what we believe if there is no resurrection then the crucifixion of christ didn't achieve anything for us and we are still in our sin as it says in verse 17 of first corinthians chapter 15 but there is a resurrection not only was it for christ but that is also for us and this is the important part of christian faith now let's look at the significance of this doctrine not just for the future but of for our day-to-day living as well it is very relevant every day of our lives now resurrection of christ gives us hope that we too would be resurrected and the scripture tell us that our resurrection is only possible through christ as it is mentioned in first corinthians chapter 15 verse 22 just as everyone dies because we all belong to adam everyone who belong to christ will be given new life that's the hope we have through christ and again we read it in first peter chapter 1 verse 3 all praise to god the father of our lord jesus christ it is by his great mercy 
that we have been born again because god raised jesus christ from the dead now we live with the great expectation now the promise of resurrection is indeed the very hope of us all since we are only mortal and unless resurrected we die we remain dead without hope of eternal life now let's jump into how and what will happen during the resurrection now it is the most interesting and at time confusing as we have many people believe in many different aspects and theories of resurrection but you need to also note that these theories are not coming out of air they are the interpretation of various bible verses and if you can recall your memory and on and our previous wcg days when i was preparing this in fact mr moses has told so many things i can tell you what will happen in the first day i'll tell you what will happen in the eighth day because the interpretation in our previous time was so much so much so so and and and, and they have so many ref, bible references to pinpoint too i can connect this i can connect it but let's try to unfold here now and the first we'll see resurrection from paul's perspective about the timing and the bodily aspect now the old testament doesn't say much about the resurrection ezekiel says a little bit and daniel says also a little bit but our belief in this topic is mostly comes from the new testament now jesus talk about the resurrection in several parables he even called himself the resurrection and life as we see in john chapter 11 verse 25 now the resurrection is mentioned in several times in the book of acts and in the book of hebrews but in most passages we don't learn much except that there will be a resurrection but there are two passages that describe the resurrection in little more detail now that is the paul's first letter to the church in thessalonica and his first letter to the corinthians now let's go to the paul first uh, letter to the thessalonians and here i will read because then uh, we will uh, then we have to go and dissect it so brothers and sisters we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of the mankind who have no hope for we believe that jesus died and rose again and so we believe that god will bring with jesus those who have fallen asleep in him according to the lord's word we tell you that we who are still alive who are left until the coming of the lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep for the lord himself will come down from the heaven with a loud command with a voice of a arching archangel and with a trumpet call of god and the dead in christ will rise first and after that we who are still alive and are left with will be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the lord in the air and so we will be with the lord forever therefore encourage one another with these words now paul isn't saying much here about the resurrection except its timing what is that there will be a resurrection and the reason we know that it is because jesus the example of true humanity was raised from the dead now we believe in his resurrection so we believe that he will also bring back to life all who believe in him and this will happen when jesus return to earth so it is about timing second aspect christians who have died will rise and those who are alive in christ will be changed and will rise in, into the clouds to meet the lord as he return and we will be with him forever so so this aspect talks more about the timing right what will happen now as we go further in first corinthians chapter 15 from verse 33 to 50 paul goes on to more detail explaining that not only there will be a resurrection but he also comments briefly on what will be what we uh, our state will be the our what our resurrected state state will be which means first he compares the resurrection to the planting of seed the seed look like a seed but a plant that grows from it looks quite different depending on what kind of seed it is as we see it in verse 37 and 38 and here uh, in verse 42 to 44 he says so will it be that the resurrection of the dead the body that is sown is perishable it is raised imperishable it is sown in dishonor 
it is raised in glory it is sown in weakness it is raised in power it is sown in natural body it is raised in a spiritual body now after we are resurrected we will be different perhaps as different as leaf from a seed now the important difference difference are that we will be um, imperishable glorious powerful and spiritual and we will look like christ okay we will be imperishable glorious powerful spiritual and we will look like christ as he goes again from verse 49 to 53 here paul is using different figure of speech that of putting of new clothes the point that he stresses the most the point that he mentions the most is that we will be imperishable our bodies will not deteriorate and we will never die we will have new glorious body transformed by the holy spirit to be like christ now please note that when we say new glorious body don't restrict that term of glorious bodies with our humanly thinking as does it has a flesh does it has a skin it could be an alternate state of body we don't know exactly but we know and we have very strong and let me repeat that one that our bodies will be imperishable glorious powerful and spiritual and we will be like christ amazing that's the that's paul talks about our resurrected state okay then we move into number of resurrections and there's a lot of discussion number of uh, resurrection some would say two while others will say three some will say one some will say uh, and then pravin briefly touch uh, millennia after millennia many things and in fact when i was preparing uh, and i had a chance to sit with mr moses and i had this big explanation of all the three uh, resurrection point to point so let's unfold here what can we make it out from the scriptures okay and we'll try to see where we can connect we'll try to see where we cannot connect now we see in daniel chapter 12 and john chapter 5 talk about one thing two group of people who are dead would rise and just let me put the slide so it is okay perfect now here let me read those verses first and then we'll read So Daniel chapter 12 verse 2 says and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to the everlasting life and some to the shame and everlasting contempt Similarly Jesus says in John chapter 5 verse 28 to 29 do not marvel at this for an hour is coming when all who are in tombs will hear his voice and come out those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment now that means daniel chapter 12 and john chapter 5 talks about two group of people who are dead would arise and be judged and these two groups are those who have done good will rise to live and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned the same group of people is apparently also spoken in matthew chapter 25 from verse 31 to 46 as they are represented in a parable by sheep and goats yeah so so please note here now what can we what one can we draw here there is no sequence given is there any sequence given here to the best of various uh, versions i have seen no sequence first this not this it is separated by the comma so it simply says the dead would rise now actually all the references of the multiple resurrection come from one place Re- revelation chapter 20 let me move now and let us read and then let us unpack and let us connect and here apostle paul says then i saw thrones and the people sitting on them had been given the authority to judge and i saw the souls of those who have been beheaded for their testimony about jesus and for proclaiming the word of god they had not worshiped the beast or his statue nor accepted his mark on their forehead for their hands or their hands they all came to life again and they reigned with christ for a thousand years this is the first resurrection and it says the rest of the dead did not come back to the life until the thousand years had ended 
and then it continues to say in verse 6 blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection for them the second death holds no power but they will be priests of god and of christ and will reign with him a thousand years now let's unpack this one now the book of revelation in chapter 20 is the only place in the bible that might suggest the idea of several perhaps three resurrections let's go point by point now the book speaks of the martyr as coming to the life and reigning with christ for a thousand years as we see in verse 4 the second is the rest of the dead do not come to life until the thousand years have ended as per verse 5 now these two coming to life events collectively are said to be first resurrection right now it is not clear how we are to understand these two rising occurring now it is very difficult for us to understand are these two risings occurring at a different times now such an ambiguity remind us and as uh, praveen has started in which uh, uh, pastor dan has uh, complimented that revelation is a highly symbolic book and it can be misleading to read it to say it in a strictly literal ways now how is that let's continue in later in chapter 20 we are told of a great white throne the judgment that is in verse 11 now in a vision john saw the dead raised to life standing before the throne as in verse 12 the people are judged according to their deeds but the text does not specifically tell us the result of that judgment though it probably refers to those who have an eternal life who are written in the book of life next we read that all who are not in the book of life pre-assembly those who rejected jesus as savior we are sent into the lake of fire as we read it in verse 14 and 15. Now this could be the same judgment to which Jesus referred in which those who have done good, he says, will rise to live eternally and those who have done will rise to be condemned as we read earlier in John chapter 5 verse 29. Now this all fits with the earlier verses in Revelation 20 that speak of what appears to be first resurrection but in two part is not clear. Yeah, let me repeat. Now, how all this fits earlier verses in Revelation 20 that speaks, which appears to be for the first resurrection in two part is not clear, right? The first part has two, but it is not clear. It is dangerous to base a conclusion about any sequence or number of resurrections solely on the few verses that we see here in uh, Revelation, which was actually written as, as a book of symbols and metaphors. And it is always not in the chronological order. So then what do we take it? How do we take the resurrection? And as I move towards the concluding part, as we now put various threads, which open, now we'll start to uh, put together. And the first, this thing is the resurrection. Now the idea of three resurrection is too specific. But the main point regarding God's gift of salvation in Christ is the truth. That is the main message. God's gift of salvation to humanity through Christ. God will ensure that everyone is given a fair opportunity to hear and respond to the gospel of salvation in Christ. We have seen it in uh, this discussion as Pastor Dan led in judgment and later in universalism also during the Q&A session. Because we were taking those who did not had a chance to hear about the gospel and had a death. We just saw that death could be one of the state, but how God would work, we don't know. And why? Because we believe in John chapter 3 verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but will have eternal life. And we know that God is just, fair and merciful. Now, no matter how he unfolds the future that the prophecies of the Bible shows, it will be good and right for everyone that we know because he has a he desires, in the last week he said, he desires for no one to be lost. That's his desire. So what can we do? We should not be dogmatic about the successive resurrection, time periods, and number of resurrections. Instead, we should emphasize on the fairness and love of God. 
that there is a resurrection and that all people who ever lived will have an opportunity to stand before our Lord and believe in him for salvation. That is the greatest hope we have. How God will make it happen? Let's not put our humanly understanding to the interpretation of the verses. God will make righteous provision of every person to know and accept the gospel. He will give, allow them to respond. As we last week we have seen, the, the responding is on to the person. But the exact timing, how that provision will happen, we cannot be dogmatic about the same. The second point I want to bring, in him we have life. Now today throughout my message, we have, we have read in him we have life. Those in Christ will have eternal life. Those who are in Christ will live and will have eternal life. Everywhere we see, and we also saw that in, in where? Here. Okay. We also saw that in Acts chapter 17, verse 20, uh, 28, where it says, For in him we live and move and have our being. In him we have life. Now, have you ever wondered, is abiding him abiding in him? or being in him, is it a one-time affair and a free ticket for the rest of the life or is it an everyday, every moment process? Is accepting Jesus our Lord and Savior, is it a one-time event and then take grace for granted and then live an everlasting life? Perhaps my personal conviction is no. Abiding in him is a continuous process we are and we need to do because we cannot be righteous on our own. We need Jesus' redeeming blood to wash us from our sin so that it enable us to be in communion with him. And that is why uh, we, we do the communion. For it says, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, For as often as you eat the bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Until he comes. Until then we need his blood to redeem us because we on our own cannot be righteous we cannot abide in him we need him and that's why he says until he is coming and then he'll be with us forever but how are we supposed to act while we are on earth now please understand while our focus is on the resurrection i am tying up why how to finally the two because we have seen the two it is glorious but we are seeing from the why to the two, I need to connect. So how do we act while we are still on the earth? And Romans chapter 6, verse 17 to 8 gives a perfect this thing. But thanks to be, thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart. And now connect back to uh, Jeremiah. He says, um, I will make them serve me. I'll make them love me. So we have accepted it from the heart. The, huh? So let me continue. Obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that you has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from slain, uh, sin and have become slaves to righteousness. We should strive to live righteous. And that is completed by his redeeming blood. To be in communion with him. That should be our every day as we wait for our uh, resurrection. And, this, and the third and the final thing. God is a God of possibilities, not certainties. I liked it so much when Praveen over and over he takes and I said, okay, let me take it and stretch it more further. Now, let me tell you why. Now, we as a human, we love certainty. Now, if you ask Praveen, Praveen, what's your plan for tomorrow? He'll say, do you think he will answer, I don't know, tomorrow will come, but I don't know what will happen tomorrow. No, we humans love certainty. Oh, I will get up, I have to do this, I have to do that, then I have to do for that. If you ask, he will have a plan for his next 10, 15 years. Because we human, we love certainties. We need to have our tomorrow sorted out. We need to have a clear in the, everything. Right? But... With that attitude, sometimes we try to limit God. We try to limit his being. We try to limit his knowledge and his functioning through our limited knowledge. We try to interpret everything in the Bible through our understanding. Yeah. 
and one of the famous human interpretation you will see is the subject of eschatology so how can we avoid being god for god you know because now we have inter- we we want to interpret what he is thinking even if he is not thinking we want to connect it so how can we avoid so i just want to say submit yourselves and allow the holy spirit to reveal god's heart and his ways in his time do, do have i unpacked everything today about uh, resurrection i myself don't know tomorrow morning the holy spirit might have another revelation to me and i'll say okay fine if i have another chance perhaps i will take that aspect as well let's not try to connect with what we can't and what we don't have sufficient information or revelation finally i love god to surprise you and your understanding when he think it's the right time we will understand we will understand and now with this we will move into uh, a session of q and a i'll try my best with my limited knowledge to clarify uh, answers and then i would request uh, all of you to join me uh, to clarify and then pastor dan and uh, praveen also to help me uh, clarify as we take up your questions so let me stop sharing and go into the gallery mode okay, okay. so let's do some q and a yeah as we get into the q and a <clears throat> sachin thank you for a well thought out uh, message certainly uh, lots to think about and as we move into the session i i just want to take a moment to welcome paul pranit who is joining us i think for the first time he is uh, in acquaintance of uh, pearl that is praveen's uh, wife uh, we want to thank you for joining us paul god bless you and uh, very grateful that you took in the time to be with us <laughs> okay all right the floor is open and sachin has all the answers <laughs> anil yes, go sir, anil well uh, no thank you sachin that was a wonderful message and i think certainly the core of the thing is jesus christ it is through his blood that we have salvation and that's what we should be concerned about but as far as the resurrection is concerned basically what you said is well there is a res- resurrection be satisfied with it don't go into when where how what and concentrate on jesus period right <laughs> in summary okay <laughs> yeah but that doesn't really answer the answer the question of you know when and how and where Uh, the, the basic questions that normally people have and of course one of them is how many resurrections will there be a physical resurrection will there be a, yes well you did mention that there is a spiritual body which could be a glorified body not necessarily so but the main aspect of the, the questions probably which is which has keep worrying in our mind is how many resurrections and the timing of it but and that Uh, probably uh, the bible isn't very clear and so we should not be speculate but at least we should be able to infer as to, from various passages what it could be i mean you you summarize very correctly and let's try to put what do we know for certain okay. which pravina started the session saying he is coming back for sure he is coming back and he is going to resurrect us for sure no question no question about it so we know the timing when he is coming we are going to get resurrected we don't, we okay. don't know the timing <laughs> we don't know the timing we yeah. don't want to know the timing but when it's right. the right time you know he will he will come but and secondly how the am i going to be the one who would be resurrected because the one question that if you have seen in the past 3 weeks is we believe that everyone would be judged then we also read it in the Reve- revelation chapter 20 in verse for, for verse 6 also that those who have uh, raised first will avoid the second death 
and we have seen through uh, pastor dan also how that judgment we uh, are we avoiding judgment are we are we are we justified through the blood of christ we have seen how how that has also beautifully unfolded right how the judgment is going to be unfolded for us and how the chance of those who did not had a chance to uh, receive uh, the salvation or hear the salvation will get approximately how that will get because if you go back to our uh, previous thinking right we would have probably say that in when we are got up when we are living with christ for the first thousand year that is the time when we'll tell everyone how to live we will uh, we will rule those who are alive right remember all this thing then we'll yeah. teach them and that is when after thousand year then devil will be released then everybody will be tested apart but there are no other significant things to connect to but one thing we are definitely doing that is because then that is why i started my this thing is if you have created a human being with your own image and in your own likeness it is very difficult for me to see that let us assume uh, i have not come to know the sal it's very difficult for me to believe if that is the case you have created a humanity then you will miss out the entire chunk is a very difficult thing to 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 miss it because that this cannot he cannot deny himself which is his nature right his nature is love and that means everybody is coming how it is coming unfortunately we are not able to fill the, fill, fill in the blanks and put the timings or so agreed and the, the, another thing connected with the resurrection is this uh, so called rapture right i mean you know the the, the church or the saved will be you know whisked away that what corinthian first corinthian 15 mentions not corinthian thessalonians i think says that we will be caught up in, in the, the air Christ. yeah to be with christ and that's what people re- interpret as the rapture so I, again i don't know whether you know there is actually going to be a rapture or what but what do these uh, uh, passages then indicate so i'll add and then i'll uh, let uh, pastor dan praveen and others also add my, my interpretation i'm adding right we need there has to be uh, whenever christ come that there are going to be a time that the, those who are believing in him are going to be alive probably not everybody died right and then only is coming <laughs> so and and his promise is true that those who are in him will have a eternal life so those by that living and that's what paul says that they will be raised up in in a body which he also explained what could be those thing in a glorified body they will be raised up now we have also seen in the last two weeks of study whether that raising up with the christ is it connected with the thousand years of living we don't know whether that connected in the air is it heaven we don't know but what we know is that if we happen to be those living one we also will be with christ and i think that's a very good hope uh, uh to to our children and their children and their children whenever that happens so uh, if i can just add uh, uh anil your question uh, you know uh, obviously has a lot of curiosity but uh, <laughs> but i don't know if we can fulfill every aspect of your curiosity that, that that is sure that is apparent that we can't answer every question but right at, you, you know what i'm saying that's fine <clears throat> yeah so what we can do is uh we can speculate and not speak dogmatically because we don't want to say something which we are not necessarily very sure of right so um you asked the question when and i think that was answered very quite quite well in the sense that the first resurrection well the first resurrection which assumes there is a second one <laughs> that's the one <laughs> but, yeah but uh, but we 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 are not um uh, certain about you know uh whether it it alludes to a second one 
right? right. I mean, right. it talks about the thousand year reign. <laughs> necessarily allude to a second one or is it talking about a, a another aspect of the resurrection one is those to life and those uh, to judgment you know so i'm not sure uh, where what what exactly that it would refer to mm-hmm. but if we are in the first resurrection why bother about what happens next right the main thing is for us to be in that first resurrection if there is a so um, uh, just a word about the rapture and this is uh, once again another very contentious uh, uh, topic right. yes uh, i think in the past we used to preach a version of the rapture where we said that christ will come and uh, take his church to a place of safety yeah and he also said it will be for three and a half years and i think if some of you uh, remember we also said where it will be etra <laughs> <laughs> that's correct in the mountains and uh, uh, well we won't say much about the mountains because we know where who the, who lives in the mountains right <laughs> so but the apostle in corinthians says that christ will raise up the dead they will rise up to meet him in the air and it says that he will return they will all come and yes. the earth is the destination right yeah. so it is not a secret place so once again we don't give too much uh, credence to this rapture as preached by some who say that we will be in heaven with him and then we will come back uh, once again we do not have scriptures that necessarily nail it down to those specifics so i'm going to leave it broad in that perspective any other questions or any other thoughts you want to add uncle zack yes shanti go ahead yeah i even according to the in the about the timing wala issue um you know when we look at uh you know first there'll be a resurrection and then the thousand years and uh, <clears throat> and then the the next resurrection all of these verses that we have read now uh you know for us we look at time in a certain way 24 hours these many seconds these many minutes right we have very limited knowledge when we say when like for example today if like like sachin was kind of talk, talking about it when we say a body what sort of a body do we venture we see you know hands legs whatever even when we say body on a, on mars we still give it eyes we still give it hands don't we because that is all that our uh, we have a limited uh, visualization or even for that matter our creativity is also limited you know to a few things and so um and then our time of course so of course peter puts a googly and he says thousand years are like nothing so it could also be that concurrently they are going on you know that people are being raised and the other ones are being given a, you know with all his uh, you know, gloriousness and in his mercy and grace the lord will be saying well here is your chance would, you know would you like to respond back to me we don't we never know it could be going concurrent too so we won't be able to exactly say as you said we can't put timeline and say this is first going to happen then the next one could happen who is to stop the lord having a concurrent events happening you know so i think it's a very fair point and good point to say that this is for sure going to happen and this is what we ought to believe in uh, the facts that are plainly very good, very well established okay thank uh, you pravin you had a thought go ahead I just would like to add a couple of thoughts. Number one is about uh, we are talking so much about first resurrection, second resurrection. We are going to be part of first resurrection. Who is going to be part of the second resurrection or uh, things? Uh, one thing we need to understand when we read Book of Revelation, Revelation alone talks about first resurrection and second resurrection, and uh, Jesus rose even before that. Okay, so Jesus' resurrection is the first resurrection we have to consider. and then immediately along with jesus few dead rose again from the dead that was written in the gospels we need to think about the resurrection and the moment uh, christ comes you know in pre millennial view uh, the rapture which anil was talking about that moment lot will be 
raised from the dead, and especially the people who are dead in Christ uh, would be raised from the dead. And then uh, scripture talks about the first resurrection, which, are, which is about the martyrs during the time of seven years of tribulation. Their resurrection, it has been spoken as the first resurrection. And then in, that is in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 and 5. And 11 onwards, it is written about the second resurrection where C has given all the dead that he has. Okay, here first resurrection, second resurrection, these are not talking about the sequence. It is talking about two kinds of resurrection. I mean, the resurrection of two kinds of people. Number one, first resurrection is about the people who put their faith in Jesus, either before the tribulation or after the tribulation, during the tribulation, whether they're martyrs or not naturally died like us. And they said, that is the reason, uh, end of five, fifth verse, it is written, those who have taken part in the first resurrection, they don't have this, uh, the power of uh, second death doesn't have any power over them. Who doesn't have the power of second death over, over them? I mean, we are the people. We all of, all of us, we don't have the power of second death on us. So the first resurrection is talking about the resurrection of uh, all those who are faithful to Christ. Or faithful to Christ means who put their faith in Christ. And second resurrection, it is talking about people who did not put their faith in Christ. That is the reason in 11, for verse 11 of a, a Revelation chapter 20, it talks about see uh, has given all the dead. There is no big, small, all people are there and they are going to be judged. That is how this it has been written. So let us not look at it as a sequence of resurrection. It is not about sequences of resurrection. It is about resurrection of what uh, uh, categories of people. Two categories. First is people who had faith in Jesus. Second is people who do not have faith in Jesus. So people who did not have faith in Jesus, they are over them. They will be power of the second death. So this is one way of taking these things. And another thing we need to take, understand also, if we, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> if you read Bible, there, there is always a one for one, uh, a God is, a God, he has very good sense of humor and uh, he, he works in such a way to put uh, religious people, uh, in, uh, you know, to bring religious people to humility, like, you know, to humble them. He does lots of things. Especially when Jesus came, most of his teachings uh, were, try, were bringing the religious people of their time uh, uh, to down, to calm them down and to humble them. Lots of things happened. One of the major things Jesus, uh, sorry, happened in Jesus' life that calmed all these so-called re re Jewish religious people is the resurrection of Jesus. The Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians, all the politicians, they said Jesus is not who he is claiming to be. And they said he, he wrongly, he is blaspheming, his teachings are wrong, he is uh, doing things by devil's work. So through resurrection, he humbled all of them down. Number one. So number two, uh, John is writing this. To whom? Uh, to Christians who are persecuted by the Romans. And in order to um, console them, comfort them, he was writing these words. At the same time, I don't have any problem to think in this direction also because uh, John, he writes about uh, the resurrection of the dead also here without writing completely, explicitly about their fate after the resurrection. He doesn't conclude there. So uh, during the time of John also, many Christians would be feeling religiously proud, spiritually proud. He can humble them. You see, it's not only you, even a non-Christians non are going to be raised from the dead. And what is their fate? We don't know. He doesn't say much about it. So that humbles them also to an extent. Uh, this is just a, a speculation. I'm not speaking dogmatic. Uh, we can think in those uh, directions also. It is because if you read the entire book of Bible, the, thought, the understanding of resurrection was not developed one, in one day. Jewish people were not having the belief or understanding of resurrection till 200 BC. After going through the, uh, this uh, Babylonian captivity, through the influence of Zoroastrianism and all, they started thinking about life after death. Before that, they didn't have that. So people who, Pharisees had a concept of resurrection. This came from the 
this exile only. So they were believing God is going to raise only Jews, no, not others. So and they were proud in their religion. So sometimes we Christians also will be proud, thinking that we are we alone are going to be raised. So he can put us down also. This is this is just some kind of speculation we can think about where we can humble ourselves and uh, realize that God, uh, we don't know what He is going to do with all others going to be risen in the second death. Where, it, where things are completely in the hands of God, and we humble, we stand, stand humble in, in His presence. I guess that's one of the thoughts I like to share. Okay, well, Sachin is standing by for more questions. <laughs> While you're thinking, uh, Bertram, you had a question. No. Okay. Okay. While you're thinking, uh, there is one question, perhaps Sachin, you, I don't know if, if you'd like to touch upon it. It is actually from our uh, booklet uh, where it says, what is, no, what happens to people between death and the general resurrection? Uh, the physical death and the resurrection, what happens to people? Yeah. So supposed to be one of the one more thing I'm supposed to add. So let me take that one. Yeah. And one thing also I, I wanted to add, uh, which I somehow skipped my mind. In all these last three weeks uh, that we are doing the Bible study, we have seen quite a lot of vertical things. Me and God and then rest of the things, almost 95% things we have put it on the God, right? God will raise, God will give chance, everything, everything. But while we are on earth and which uh, uh, we have a big role to play uh, and that Jesus has given us a very big mission that go therefore and and share the message of gospel. So it's not just vertically when you know the vertical we have a horizontal responsibility to, to do that. So it's alone God let him do that I am saved now I am going it's not that we need to do have that horizontal aspect also. And let me now cover the second question of are the dead conscious or conscious prior to the return of Christ? What happens to the body? Yeah, so I think there are two questions. I'll, I'll just read it out one second and then we can go. Uh, okay, yeah. Mm, yeah. What happens to the to people between death and general resurrection? Now, when we die, uh, and this is, uh, I'm reading it from the, uh, what we believe uh, booklet. When we die, a body of flesh and bones decay, but, but by the will of God, our spirit, which returns to God, lives on waiting the general resurrection at Jesus' return, when we will be given glorified bodies. So in other terms, our spirit is in a, waiting condition our body decays and that is given more clearly let me take some references here hmm. one second hold on yeah yeah so i'll take another thing that is taken uh, again which is the question that is again uh, connected to it are the dead conscious or unconscious prior to the return of christ and the resurrection of the body and uh, this is again uh, covered in the often asked question in the GCI website and the answer that goes, Christians vary in their interpretation of the relevant biblical passage and our members are no exception. Some passages seem to suggest an unconscious state and that one of the verse I'll read, I was reading just before our start of our Bible study. That is Acts chapter 13 verse 36. There are many verses. It's uh, talked more often in Psalm uh, chapter 6 verses 5, 13 verses 3, 1, 46 verse 3 and 4. But I like to read it from Acts chapter 13 verse 36. This cannot be, uh, and it says, this cannot be a reference to David for after he passionately served God, desired for his generation, desires for his generation, he died. He was buried with, an, with his ancestor and his body experienced decay. So it says the body decays, but the spirit lives. Now let me open one or two references that says about spirit. One second. Psalm chapter 6. Okay. 
Psalm chapter 6 verses 5 also talks about how can I be good to you dead for those who are in the grave graveyard sing no songs in the darkness of the death who remembers you how could I bring you praise if I am buried in the tomb so that again talks about the dead body but the spirit uh, being uh, spirit in an unconscious state the second sp spiritual evidence for some form of conscious state is a, again it says that this scriptural evidence for some form of conscious state is a very strong this thing as it covers in philippians chapter 1 from verse 21 to 24 again in thessalonians chapter 4 13 to 14 and again in revelation chapter 6 from 9 to 11 certainly the body dies and decays but the passage indicate that the spirit which is our soul of believers is consciously present with God. Whichever view is correct, one thing we can know for certain is that the dead are safe in God's hand awaiting the resurrection. Would you like to add anything, Uncle Zach? Uh, yeah, I think... Uh... The question once again is whether the spirit is conscious uh, or not. And I think you answered that. We uh, are safe in God's hands, basically. Yes, Bertie, go ahead. Uh, I think it's uh, very strongly mentioned in Catholicism and possibly other religions also that when the dead... Uh, the righteous dead, as they understand, will go to heaven immediately on death and live on there and whatnot. And uh, uh, and uh, you know the incorrigible wicked, uh, you know, will uh, will be in hell. What is this? What do they understand by even now? Uh, they mention about uh, you know uh, life in heaven. I think uh, Catholics and many uh, probably other religions strongly mention about after death they go to heaven where they are living. Mr. Zakari, could you throw some light on it? See, that is the general uh, explanation given by most faiths that when you die, you will go to heaven. And you forgot to add that they, be, they will be playing a guitar or maybe a <laughs> harp. <laughs> so we don't know. Or, uh, of course, there will be other pleasures, you know. Yeah. They, once again, we are getting into speculative speculation. Yeah. There is nothing in the Bible that we can point out to that says any of this. And uh, like I said in the past many a times, when God is silent, it is best to shut our mouths. <laughs> <laughs> because you will be unnecessarily saying things which uh, God has not uh, inspired to be recorded in the scriptures. Uh, but uh, right. Anil, yes. No, but in a way, when you no, know, the Bible says the body decays, but the spirit goes to God. So in a way, after death, we are with God, isn't it? Whether in heaven or you know in purgatory, I don't know, but. We are still with God. So to that extent, it's correct, right? Yes, I think that's what uh, Sachin very clearly, the, the yeah. passage is no, very clear. I, I, Bertie was mentioning that they believe that we go to God in heaven. So yes, our, our spirit goes to God. And in that sense, uh, after death, we are with God, right? Yeah, not only going to God, you're right, uh, uh, Anil, but uh, living in heaven. <laughs> Well, I don't know. What do you mean by living? <laughs> I mean, partying and all that kind of thing or what? <laughs> yeah. they, forget the, they forget the earthly reality. <laughs> As scripture says, the, the Lord will come down and we'll be kings and priests uh, to serve our Lord and, and Father and we shall be with him evermore. It's down here. Right. Yeah. Once again, I think let's stay, uh, stay close to the Bible. The Bible says that the spirit returns to God. Now, that's all it says. Yeah. It doesn't say anything further. It returns to God. So basically saying we are safe in God's hands. Whether it is conscious, not conscious, whether will there be a reuniting of, a, of the body and the spirit or a, a new glorified body? Well, these things, you know, we can keep uh, arguing about.
Catholics also mention about a uh, intermediary uh, state, purgatory. Catholics, uh, I don't know how 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 they get it, from where they get it from. Uh, I do not know. Yeah, well, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> Any, any other thoughts? Uh, otherwise, uh, Sachin, could you just uh, maybe, uh, if possible, throw some light on the fact that Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Did you have any thoughts to, add to what Christ meant? I am the resurrection? Well, I was preparing uh, the, the whole theme is is around jesus in abide in him in him we have our living our soul and in in him we have everything and that being in him he himself uh, what can i say with that is a big evidence and that's a big promise and hope for us uh, as he is resurrected we will be resurrected in him we have life in him uh, uh, we have our being not here also in the eternity yeah yeah i think that's well said Praveen, you want to add something okay right yeah i think uh, yeah christ uh, it is in him we have the resurrection and so he becomes our resurrection because he was himself resurrected and we are almost like you know in him uh, as he takes us in you to to be united with the father Okay, well, uh, I hope uh, that was uh, reassuring for all of us to know uh, that in, when Jesus returns, we will have the promise of the resurrection with glorified bodies. And so we have some of the answers, but of, obviously there are many more that uh, we will have to wait to see how it will unfold. Uh, with that, uh, can I request Franklin Poppins, our elder, to lead in a closing prayer at this time? Yes, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Yes. yes sir, uh, one thought, sir. One thought, if one, of, if one of you all can throw light. The basis of our, of our resurrection is Christ's resurrection. Correct. The foundation of our resurrection is Christ. Am I correct, sir? Because Sachin, Christ rose from the dead, you and I will be raised. Sachin, you want to add something to that? That's a hope. That's the only evidence we have. And based on that evidence, we have everything to hope for. Nothing else. Yeah. I had one simple thought, actually. The moment we think about eschatology, second coming of Jesus, we want to know more details and more things with certainty, uh, when it is going to happen, what is it going to happen, and what is going to happen to Christians, what's going to happen to non-Christians, or these, that, and all we are going to talk. Uh, we call it eschatology. Karl Barth, uh, in, in his perspective, he calls it the doctrine of hope. Eschatology. He doesn't call it the doctrine of end times or last things. He calls it doctrine of hope. Uh, how many of you would like to have hope? I guess I guess all all of you like to have hope. You know, if we are certain about something in the future, then it is no more a hope. If we are certain about something in the future, we are it's no more a hope. If, uh, our hope. So if we have, if you want to have hope, we should be courageous enough to be uh, in the realm where, uh, uh, or we should be courageous enough to join the club of Jesus where we accept to say that, I don't know. That's a great thing about uh, these. So if we want to find all certainty answers with certainty, then uh, we won't have this hope. So our hope for future is not about the things that are going to happen, what God is going to do also, our hope lies in Jesus. That's what very in simple words, when Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He is the life himself. So our hope is in somebody, not in, in his uh, timeline or interpretation of prophecies or any other. 
So our hope is in Jesus. So he always puts us into, uh, he, he opens doors to infinite possibilities as such in said. So we should keep our minds and hearts open for that. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, Uncle, if I may add, I uh, is that okay? Yeah, yeah, Paul, go ahead. Yeah, so I echo, I echo what uh, Brother Praveen said because that's uh, uh, you know that's how I also understood uh, Matthew chapter twenty-four, where he says that uh, in verse forty-two onwards, where it says, "Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come." And it says, "But know this that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched." and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man uh, uh, cometh. So, you know, I think uh, there lies the answer that, you know, if you knew what, what time, uh, you know, we all would be with the Lord, then I don't think we would even watch, because then we would know, okay, at that time he's coming, so until that time, let's just keep doing whatever we want to do. And then at that point in time, you know, buckle up, dress up and everything, you know. So, uh, yeah, so, I, and, and I think it's, uh, if I'm, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is also called as the uh, doctrine of imminence, where, you know, you don't know when he comes and uh, you just uh, are always watchful. So it's not a uh, watchfulness where you're waiting on a particular time to come, but you're always passively watching and you're always like constantly being ready. Yeah, so these are just some of my thoughts. Thank you, Paul. I think uh, those are some uh, very good additions. I think what we can conclude with all that, what you have said and others have said, our eyes must be on Jesus, not on anything else. Our eyes must be on Jesus. He is finally our hope. And he is the evidence of everything. On that note, Franklin, could you please lead us in a closing prayer? Gracious Father, a loving Lord in heaven, we bow our heads, Lord. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful opportunity to meet here on this virtual platform and to learn. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for being with all of us and giving us a heart to learn and to grow in your grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you, Lord, for all, this, the, for all our panel of speakers who help us in understanding and uh, helping us to learn more. Thank you so much. Lord, if we have hope in this life only, then as the Bible beautifully puts it, we are men most miserable. Lord, thank you, Father. <coughs> Just as Christ rose from the dead, Lord, you are, you are going to give each and every one of us the opportunity to be resurrected and to be glorified with the heavenly body. Lord, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for the hope you have given us, the fundamental hope, Lord, on which the Judeo-Christian worldview stands unique, unique in, in so many ways, but in this particular aspect. Lord, thank you, Father. Lord, be with all of us, Father. Lord, open our hearts and minds to an understanding of your word and help us, Lord, to grow into a deeper and a stronger relationship with you day by day, even as we look forward to the glorious future you have in store for us. Lord, we ask your presence with every one of us as we move into the week and live our lives May we live a life that is pleasing in your sight, that will bring honor and glory to your name. Thank you, Father. Thank you so much, Lord. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Thank you, Sachin, for a well-researched uh, uh, you know, uh, presentation. And certainly, uh, welcome to Paul. And I think if there was Pastor Chandu who also joined us today. Thank you all for joining us and may the Thank love you, of our, yeah, love of our Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus and the communion of the Spirit be with you all. Have a good evening and of course a good morning for uh, Anil and Rekha. God bless you. Thank you. See you next week. <laughs>